infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Hey everybody, Robert here. I uh, appreciate you listening once again. And I encourage you to check out the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, uh, for uh, news about uh, worms and germs. And uh, today I want to talk about vaccines. And uh, there is likely no bigger accomplishment in medicine and public health that has saved so many lives and prevented so much misery over the decades as the introduction of vaccines. In the U.S. alone, between 1963 and 2015, nearly 200 million cases of polio, measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, uh, rabies, and hepatitis A, and about 450,000 deaths from these diseases were prevented because of vaccination, according to researchers' estimates. Well, joining me now uh, to answer some questions about vaccines is Dr. Melvin Sanicus. Uh, Dr. Sanicus is a vaccinologist. He is a public health physician, and his professional experience spans the globe. And for the past 10 years, he has been involved in different stages of drug and vaccine development. And his research has been in Asia Pacific, the United States, Africa, and Europe. He was a Global Health Fellow at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and a Fellow of the Royal Society for Public Health. Dr. Sanicus, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much, Robert. Okay, well, let's go ahead and start out um, with some technical aspects that many people may not understand, and that is, how are vaccines made? Okay, so vaccines are made using a virus or a bacteria or part of it, but in a form that is not able to cause harm. There are different approaches to designing vaccines. So these approaches are based on information about the pathogen the vaccine will prevent, such as how it infects cells and how the immune system responds to it. Also practical considerations such as regions of the world where the vaccine will be used are also important because the strain of a virus may be different in various parts of the world. But there are different types of vaccines, and they are generally created through a three-step process. Firstly, the antigen is generated. Then the antigen is isolated from the cells used to create it and then purified. And then the vaccine is made by adding adjuvants or stabilizers. So adjuvants increase immune response of the antigen, and stabilizers increase the storage life of the vaccine. Okay, so how do vaccines work? I mean, what's the science behind it? Okay, so a vaccine is a biological preparation that improves immunity to a specific disease. So when you receive a vaccine, your body thinks that the small amount of the pathogen or the antigen is the disease itself, and your immune system starts creating antibodies or proteins that destroy invading pathogens. So the vaccine essentially stimulates the body's immune system to recognize the antigen as foreign, destroy it, and remember it so that the immune system can more easily recognize and destroy any of these pathogens in the future. Now, um, there's a term that we hear quite frequently. It's called herd immunity. Um, can you explain what that is and why is it important? So herd immunity is also called herd effect or community immunity or population immunity. When a high percentage of the population is protected through vaccination against a virus or bacteria, there is herd immunity. Um, it is especially important for protecting people who cannot be vaccinated. These include children who are too young to be vaccinated, people with immune system problems, and those who are too ill to be vaccinated, such as cancer patients, for example. So the proportion of the population which must be immunized in order to receive, to have herd immunity, varies between the different diseases, but the underlying idea is simple. Once enough people are protected, they help to protect vulnerable members of the community by reducing the spread of the disease. Okay. Now, vaccines, like other medical interventions, are, are not 100% effective. How, uh -huh. However, the effectiveness of most vaccines are, are pretty high. 
Um, can, mm-hmm. can you explain why vaccines are not 100% effective and why do they sometimes require boosters and while some others do not? Okay, so vaccines work really well, like you mentioned. Most childhood vaccines produce immunity about 90 to 100 percent of the time, and that is pretty high. And if you look at the history of any vaccine preventable disease, you will virtually always see that the number of cases of disease starts to drop when a vaccine is introduced in a specific country, for example. So our response to vaccines are affected by a lot of things. Our immune and nutritional status, age, so the very young and the elderly immune system is not working as well as the adult immune system, and even sex. There are actually studies showing sex-based immunological differences, and there's a recent comprehensive nature review, in fact, show, showing that these differences may contribute to variations in the incidence of autoimmune disease, susceptibility to infectious diseases, and response to vaccine in males and females. And about your question um, on boosters, so it depends on a variety of factors, including disease progression and immunological memory. Immunological memory refers to the ability of the immune system to respond to a, a pathogen. So the faster the immune system can recognize a pathogen and prevent disease, the better. Whether it is necessary to boost immune memory with a follow-up shot depends on the speed of, the, of disease progression. So in cases involving slow-moving infections, the immune, system, the immune memory is activated with plenty of time to respond. So in these cases, a booster vaccine is not necessary to maintain immunity. Okay. Let me ask you about one of the more uh, complicated uh, vaccinations. That's the flu shot. And uh, how do they determine the strains for the vaccine, you know, each and every year? Um, so flu virus are constantly changing. Um, the vaccine composition is reviewed each year and updated based on influenza viruses that are making people sick the extent to which these viruses are spreading, and how well the previous season's vaccine protect against those viruses. So there are more than 100 national influenza centers in over 100 countries conducting year-round surveillance for influenza, and these centers receive and test thousands of influenza virus samples from patients. The laboratories then send these representative viruses to the WHO collaborating centers for reference and research on influenza. There's one in Atlanta, Georgia. There's one in London one in Australia, one in Tokyo, one in Beijing. And experts meet twice a year. They review the results of surveillance, laboratory, and clinical studies, and they make recommendations on the strains to be included in the vaccine. Do the, do the flu viruses uh, typically originate in Asia or somewhere else? Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's in Asia mostly. Mm-hmm. That's especially the, the bird flu, for example. Um, and, and the reason for that is because there are a lot of bird markets in Asia, poultry markets. So there's increased chances for the different um, birds, for example, to um, infect each other. Okay. Um, now, here, here's something that comes up pretty frequently is, you know, how safe are vaccines? Yes. The science in this issue is clear. Numerous studies have shown over and over again that vaccines are safe and effective. And serious side effects are very rare. And panel of experts have confirmed again and again that today's vaccines are safer than ever. In fact, the greatest risk come when children are not immunized. And, and something that we should actually um, remember is that before a vaccine is ever approved and licensed, it goes through years of testing for safety and effectiveness. They are developed to meet the highest standards and are still being monitored for safety. Of course, no vaccine or medicine is perfect. Some people who are immunized will experience reactions. Fortunately, when they occur, most are mild and short-lived, and after a few days, these minor symptoms disappear with no lasting effects. Um, I'd like to go ahead and ask you about some of the misconceptions and falsehoods that are becoming very popular across the globe uh, concerning vaccines. And um, let me start with this. Um, Some have said that babies can't tolerate so many vaccines at such a young age. True or false? This is not true. Children are exposed to many foreign antigens every day. Eating food introduces new bacteria into the body, and numerous bacteria live in the mouth and nose, exposing the immune system to still more antigens. 
it is highly unlikely that the number of separate antigens contained in vaccines will represent added burden in the immune system. And in fact, available scientific data show that simultaneous vaccination with multiple vaccines has no adverse effect on the normal childhood immune system. And also a number of studies and reviews have been conducted to examine the effects of giving various combinations of vaccines simultaneously. And these studies have shown that the recommended vaccines are as effective in combination as they are individually. Okay, and probably the most controversial one um, is, uh, do vaccines cause different health problems, autism being the big one, and some other conditions? Mm -hmm. I, again, the science in this is very clear, Robert. Mm -hmm. There is no link between vaccines and autism. Vaccine ingredients do not cause autism as well. So the paper that first suggested a link between vaccines and autism has been retracted after the findings were debunked. In 2010, the study's lead author, um, Andrew Wakefield, he was further accused of fraud, ethical violations, scientific misinterpretations, and his license to practice medicine was revoked in the United Kingdom. Since the study was published in 1998, Extensive research has debunked any association between vaccines and autism. Dozens of independent studies conducted over the last um, two decades have come to the same conclusion, basically, that vaccines do not cause autism. And given this substantial body of evidence, the scientific community agrees that neither vaccines nor the ingredients are linked to development of autism. Right. Now, now, some say when they're arguing against vaccinations, that hygiene and, and better nutrition are really responsible for the reduction in disease rates and not vaccination. What do you say? Well, improved hygiene and socioeconomic conditions have undoubtedly had an indirect impact on disease. And better nutrition, not to mention the development of antibiotics and other treatments, have increased survival rates as well. But if you look at the actual incidence of disease over the years, it is very clear that vaccines have had significant direct impact. There are numerous scientific publications about this, and CDC has some infographics showing the global impact of vaccine. Here you will clearly see the decline of the disease um, a year or so after the introduction of the vaccine. Um, now, is natural immunity better than vaccine-acquired immunity? Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, so... The only way to get immunity is through infection with the actual disease. So this means that you have to get infected. But let's say that these diseases that vaccines prevent can be dangerous or even deadly. Both natural immunity and vaccine-induced immunity result in long-lasting, sometimes lifelong immunity. However, the benefits of vaccine-induced immunity are much greater and the risk is much lower. And to put things into perspective, about one out of a thousand children infected with varicella will develop severe pneumonia or encephalitis. And five to 10% of people who get meningococcal meningitis die even with antibiotic treatment. And those who live, another 10 to 20% of them lose their arms or legs or have problems with their nervous systems. So these are things that we don't want to have. Both natural immunity and immunity from vaccines provide protection, but getting sick or Putting others in danger is definitely not worth the risk. Okay. Um, now, let me close with this. Um, back in January, I republished one of your articles, uh, the top 10 biggest vaccine stories of 2016, on my website. Um, Dr. Sanicus, today, what vaccines do you think are the most critical to get through the pipeline and out to the market? Well, from a global perspective, global health perspective, Vaccines against the big three, HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis, will really make an impact. But these may take some time. New vaccines are good, and we definitely need vaccines for diseases like Ebola, Zika. But what is more important, I think, is to increase coverage of the current vaccines that we already have in the market, in particular the newer vaccines proven to protect against pneumonia and diarrhea, the two leading infectious killers of children. And in the U.S., you know, the CDC puts the average number of annual influenza deaths somewhere between 3,000 and 49,000, depending on the season. And that's a huge number, and we have flu available that can reduce that number. All right, very good. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Melvin Sanicus, for your time and expertise, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Robert.